Settle in class, today we're talking about the Monk, masterful martial artist that can snatch arrows out of the air and run up walls and punch all their problems away. People like to dunk on them because they're unrealistic. No way could they fight someone with a sword and armor, let alone a dragon. Well, these monks are faster than a tiger and stronger than a gorilla. Those things that can break iron without the extra speed and force. Dragon scale doesn't stand a chance. You ready to learn? Let's go! The monks are a bit odd for close quarter skirmishers. They only get proficiency in simple weapons and short swords, and have to stick to a shorter list of melee monk weapons for most abilities, keeping them pretty close range. Yet despite that, they get no armor proficiency, and a d8 hit die means you can't take too many hits. So what makes them work? Well, who needs weapons when you have the rest of your body? Your unarmed strike starts at 1d4 and eventually rises up to 1d10. And these strikes aren't just punches, they're kicks and elbows and headbutts. You'll be using them often, as you make one as a bonus action whenever you attack with your monk weapon or strike. And as for your lack of armor, you add dex and wisdom to your AC. You'll be wanting dex anyway because you use it instead of your strength for punches and monk weapons. And you'll already be wanting wisdom to boost the saves of your main feature, key at level 2. Your key is basically magic points that you can use to do cool things. The amount you have is equal to your level and they come back on a short rest. You can spend them on plenty of fun tricks like dashing and dodging and disengaging. Later on you can do things like launching the arrows you caught right back at them, or re-rolling saving throws. But there are two options that stand out amongst the crowd. At level 2 you can get two extra punches called a flurry of blows, and at level 5 you can attempt to stun people. Doing those at the same time is a combo to help them get their reputation. If you look around you'll find most people think they're either really weak or really strong. That's because they are custom built to counter everything a new DM knows. That stunning flurry combo can wreck a solo big monster, which is every newbie's crutch, but look at that crazy amount of other abilities. You move faster as you level up, so with the dash ability, nothing can catch you, especially when you start running up walls and across water. And if they do, just jump off the wall and ignore five times your level and fall damage. You also start ignoring damage on any save you pass, and only take half even if you fail. And if they start trying to use conditions instead, you become immune to disease and poison and can break out of charms and fear. And then you become proficient in all saving throws and just stop failing in general. You'll eventually speak and understand all languages so they can't rely on miscommunication problems. And they couldn't even disarm you if they literally took your arms. So taking away your stuff doesn't even really hurt. You block everything a young DM knows how to do, then backflip off the villain's tower to stun lock them. However, as they mature, they learn how to counter it. And a jack of all trades character like a monk can feel weak compared to a specialist. Don't let that get you down though. Even with a veteran DM, their abilities offer things that no one else can. The rest of those abilities come from their subclasses at level 3, 6, 11, and 17, though they already have so many. Name another level 2 character that can hit three things in six seconds. I mean, it's taken you how long just to hit two? Yeah, that's right, I put the part where I ask you to like and subscribe where you least expect it, just like the way of the Shadow Monk. Believe it or not, they're basically a ninja. They get the minor illusion cantrip to cause distractions and such, and can use their key to cast darkness, dark vision, pass without a trace, or silence. And that darkness is important, because at level 6, they can teleport between areas with dim light and darkness, as long as they can see the exit. They even get advantage on the first punch as you burst out from behind. All the more reason to stay in the shadows, because at 11 you can just turn invisible. It breaks if you leave the darkness or cast magic or attack, but there's no limit on uses or time. Now level 17 is kind of basic, making an opportunity attack when someone else hits a target, but more punches per round is always nice to have. I don't know what else to say, this one's pretty dead set on the theme. You're naturally suited for infiltration, and remember that silence is great utility. Everyone uses it to shut up casters, but it's perfect perfect for making sure no one hears you fighting guards or tearing down doors. And I know you can't pick a lock, but you can look through keyholes and cracks under doors to teleport past them. Just bring a little drill or something and you can get past anything, especially thanks to Pass Without a Trace and Infinite Invisibility. In my humble opinion, you're one of the best scouts possible, and I'd be even more flattering if I placed less value on my life. And you do still have other flavor options. I love the idea of a stagehand who's just really good at set changes and fixing little mistakes without people noticing. You could be some sort of back alley thief or a smuggler or a poacher, but stealth is pretty much inescapable with this one. By the way, um, DMs? Favor for me? Let them see in their own darkness. It's not gonna break anything. Even some of the other monks do it. It was just the first book, and they undershot the balance. Speaking of begging your DM for mercy, that's all gonna flip when you roll up the Way of the Mercy. A monk with a Plague Doctor flavor of all things. It can look like anything, but the first option is the classic bird beak. You get proficiency with insight, medicine, and an herbalism kit to go with it. The theme is simple. Merciful healing and mercy kill. At level 3, you get your hand of healing, which lets your punch heal instead of hurt. One key to use, but the first one is free when you use your flurry of blows. On the flip side, Hand of Harm lets you deal extra necrotic damage for just one key per turn. At level 6, the Harming Hand also poisons people. Not with a save, they're just poisoned. Meanwhile, your Healing Hand cures disease, being poisoned, blinded, deafened, stunned, or paralyzed. At level 11, when you use your Flurry of Blows, you can make your hits be healing or hurting without spending any key. And at level 17, for one action, you can bring back the dead. They have to have died within a day, and you have to long rest between you 
choices, but that is still really useful. And honestly, the whole class is. A healer that doesn't lose their attack when they heal, and feels at home on the front line, and the poison makes it hard for their foes to even hit anyone to begin with. My main question is exactly how you lost that medical license. Are you a combat medic, providing healing while knowing where best to hurt? Or maybe a mad doctor, only knowing how to heal because it keeps your test subjects in life for longer? A torturer would work well from that angle. Gotta know how to remove those conditions and keep them conscious. Maybe you were the on-site doctor for a gladiator pit or a boxing ring, so you know some basic first aid, but also how to defend yourself. And what's up with that mask anyway? Are you just trying to hide from malpractice law? Or is it a symbolic thing? A sign of your order, the mark of your god? Or a really messed up sense of humor? Someone half-conscious sees the skull mask and thinks they're dying, and you just find that hilarious. But if you're really wanting to focus on that death part, the way of the long death is for you. The logic behind long death is that you know how to do it because frankly you're kind of obsessed with it. At third level, you suck the life out of fallen creatures, gaining temporary HP. At six, you go full Naruto villain and terrify everyone with your raw killing intent. At 11, if you run out of HP, you can use one key to bring yourself back to one. Because who needs armor when you just refuse to die? But the enemy doesn't have that option, because at level 17 you get Touch of Long Death, 2d10 of necrotic damage for every point you put into it. And unlike most monk abilities that tap out at 3, the maximum key you can use on this one is 10. So just casually blast them for up to 200 damage. 110 on average. Now there's obvious ways to go with this, like an Order of Assassins or Cultist Worshipping Death, but while we love a serial killer terrifying everyone with euphoric frenzy, here's my pitch for Way of Long Death. You're not even trained in fighting. You're just a mad scientist. You don't know how to use a club, but you know the fracture points of their bone. You're terrifying everyone with your emotionless efficiency, and anyone could run a few steps across water if they just understood surface tension and worked on their sprint. And as for your key, you aren't tapping into magic to push beyond your normal limits. Those techniques are your baseline, you just get tired easy. When you're out of key, you're just running on fumes and aren't used to your test subjects fighting back. And no matter what you go with, I would recommend thinking more about that key. Is that divine power from a god you worship? Or raw power siphoned from your soul? Or maybe it's time magic and you're borrowing from that moment you spent meditating. And speaking of time, how is this death long? You instantly exploded their heart with the force of a meteor storm. Way of the Open Hand should have taken that name. Your level 17 ability is Save or Die. Except that death isn't instant. At any time over your level and days, you can make that person die as an action. Unless they make the save, then they take 10d10 necrotic damage instead. It only costs 3 key to use, but you do need a separate action to activate it, so it kind of balances out. And I know that save or die sounds really strong, but spellcasters have wish and meteor storm at this point. It's fine. Lower levels are what matter most, and they're much more restrained. At level 11, you get the effect of a sanctuary spell at the end of a long rest, which makes no one want to hit you until you draw first blood. At 6, you can heal yourself once per long rest, and at level 3, you start with the open hand technique. Open hand technique is a buff to your flurry of blows, giving every successful hit an additional effect. You can try to knock them over or push them 15 feet, or just take their reactions away. Flurry of Blows was already your monk's bread and butter. Open Hand specializes in just making it even better. Flurry, stun, then throw him off a cliff. Knock him over and take the reaction. Honestly, this monk would make a good schoolyard bully. Some sort of blue-blooded brat that got private karate lessons. Wait a second. Karate do directly translates to Way of the Empty Hand. I think this is actually just karate. What level of black belt do you learn to make people's hearts stop? Uh, anyway, this makes for a great non-violent martial artist. You'll kill them if you have to, but you'd rather just drive them off. From masters looking to humble opponents to those who use any tactic it takes to win. Every class has at least one path that doubles down on the stereotype, and half of that is open hand. The kensei is the other half, the weapon master. They use their weapon as deftly as a calligraphy pen or a paintbrush, which you're now proficient with. The path of the kensei has you choose two weapons, one ranged and one melee, though you'll get to pick five by the end. And these can be martial weapons as well, as long as they don't have the heavy property like the battle axe. While using the melee weapon, you can add two to your AC any round you've made an attack. If you have a ranged weapon, you can spend your bonus action adding 1d4 to the damage of a shot. It's not that much, but never say no to free damage. And if you want even more pain, at level 6 you can spend a key to add your martial arts die to an attack. Not only is that basically a second attack landing, it's multiplied on a crit and you decide to use it after you roll. You can always double crit. Your weapons also start counting as magic, useful if your DM is light on the magic weapons. Level 11 is good for that too, letting you spend up to 3 key for an attack and damage boost equal to that amount for 1 minute. This has helped even more at level 17, where you can re-roll an attack once per turn. So you're probably gonna hit, and more rolls means more possible crits to boost. I love seeing abilities feed into one another. Now I personally don't really get the hype with Kensei, but uh, word to the wise, let him use heavy weapons. Slave-like weapons are traditional, and one or two extra damage isn't gonna break anything. And besides, have you seen Tasha's Cauldron? They gave an optional rule that basically gives every monk Kensei weapons that they can change in a long rest. Let them have something. And speaking of that something, consider that precious weapon when making a character. Were you trained in the axe and longbow as a defender of the forest? Are you from a coastal 
monastery, trained in tridents for underwater skirmishes. And the book says you're fine to reskin weapons as other things. Maybe you made it from the melted trophies of great bows, and it grows larger over time. You're a wrestler with a steel chair great club, a clown with a squeaky hammer, or a chef with a giant's cleaver as a sword. And does your personality match the weapon type? Like someone who's standoffish and cold using whips and bows. I've said this before, but I think that matching personality with a mismatched body type is just peak design. Big weapon, small and cute, preferably pink. I will die on this hill. But let's broaden our focus a bit. Instead of a weapon, let's control the elements. Do you want to master water, earth, fire, air, then disappear when the party needs you? Well, the four elements monk gets a giant list of ability options and keep choosing new ones for their subclass feature. Everyone gets the elemental attunement option for free, giving you a bunch of minor elemental tricks. Forming an element into a rough shape, chilling or warming things, snuffing out torches, that sort of stuff. But to truly master the elements of earth, wind, fire, and September, you must first choose one of the other options from the list. Most of these are just spells, but there's some pretty good options in here, especially the ones with level restrictions like Wall of Stone. And don't worry, whenever you get a new ability, you can also change a previous one, so you won't be stuck with the early game stuff forever. I personally recommend either Water Whip or Unbroken Air to start with, because knocking people out of the air or repositioning them could be really useful. It's a little tricky to build if you're only wanting to focus on one element, but elemental warriors are as old as the dirt they embody, so let me take this moment to ask how the heck you got those powers. Training and stuff, I know, but what did that even look like? Maybe you're a sorcerer, and instead of sending your magic outward through spells and such, you absorb it back into your body for a boost. Or maybe you're touched by Fey and channeling the power of seasons instead of elements. There's precedent for it, just look at the Eladrin. Maybe you made a pact with elemental lords. Or you're the ultimate genasi and have a bit of everything in you. Hell, if we're gonna have an elemental inside us, go all the way. Your training was actually to become a thoughtless vessel, allowing spirits of nature in to rampage in your stead. Why learn magic when you can let someone else do it for you? Just think about it, because that theme is most of what this class has. It drains your key incredibly quick. But if you're just after the elemental damage in flight, there's a new subclass that's got you covered. You know they had to make a dragon warrior, it's a classic. At level 3, you learn Draconic, reroll a persuasion or intimidation check once a long rest, and can make your unarmed attacks deal acid, cold, fire, lightning, or poison. You can also breathe one of those elements in a 20-foot cone or a 30-foot line, dealing two of your martial arts die. You can use it your proficiency bonus times per day, but if you're out, you can spend two key points instead. And Dragonborn can eat their heart out because you don't have to choose an element. You breathe them all whenever you want. At level 6, you can sprout wings when you use your dash or disengage bonus action letting you fly for your proficiency times per day. At level 11, once per day, you get a 10-foot aura. You can either try to frighten a nearby creature, or give yourself and your allies resistance to one of your usual elements. First time spree, then it costs 3 key. Oh, and your breath does 3 damage dice now. Finally, at level 17, you get another set of 3 powers. Your breath weapon can now be charged for 1 key to do 4d10 with triple the range. Your aura now does 3d10 damage in a 10-foot radius around you, and you now have a 10-foot radius special blind sight that lets you see invisible creatures. Wait, wouldn't I normally be wrapping up around now? Why is the monk of all things making me talk so much? Anyway, outside of a recommendation to let the monks just fly when they use their dash, because they're already using a key, I honestly really like the dragon monk. About everything I could ask for outside psionic variants. These are disciples of dragons, often literally, sometimes even chosen by a god. But these don't have to just be inspired martial arts. You can flavor yourself as half dragon, or a dragon who got stuck while transformed. Or maybe you're some sort of dragon fanatic, and your feral fan obsession had you take horrific steps towards becoming one, like grafting their flesh to your own, or consuming a wormling in its lair and taking it as your home, because that's basically what this subclass is, becoming a dragon. You could always give it a totem barbarian spin and take aspects of different monsters, and I doubt people would call you out if you called yourself a demonologist instead, but dragons really are unique. No other type of creature has this type of ability. Then again, this is D&D. We aren't here to be a dragon, so let's rock the dragon with Sun Soul. This is a Dragon Ball character, let's just get that out of the way. You're more of a Krillin or a Yamcha than you are a Piccolo, but that's not too bad in the D&D world. Level 3 starts off with a Radiant Sunbolt. You can now place any unarmed strike with an energy blast, doing radiant damage with a 30-foot range. A lack of range was one of the monk's biggest weaknesses. Whenever you get low on HP, just stay at a range and blast away. 30 feet isn't huge, but your speed really makes it hard for foes to close the gap. And if they do, at level 6 you cast Burning Hands. Kinda weird that it's not radiant damage, but it's not a bad AoE. And at level 11 you get a much bigger one. Searing Sunburst is a 20-foot radius blast of light with a range of 150 feet. 2d6 isn't much, but it doesn't cost key. Unless you want to bump the damage up, 2d6 per key. At this point, very few things can catch you or outrange you, so you're always in control of how the fight flows. You might not do quite as much damage as other ranged units, but with a 
evasion and arrow catching, they aren't hurting you much either. And when one of you decides to come in close instead of harassing at a range, level 17 gives you Sun Shield. You can turn on a glowing aura of power, a state that very few can reach. As long as you're in this super state, which lasts as long as you want, you can basically make a special opportunity attack when people hit you in melee. It automatically hits and deals flat damage. 5 plus wisdom modifier. It's not my absolute favorite, but I am a big defender of the Sun Soul. Most classes struggle with key consumption or directly competing with stunning strike. This one's abilities are mostly free and designed for times when stunning strike isn't viable. The monk's biggest problems are low health and lack of range, and this one gets around both. I think that people are just thrown off by the theming and horde of Dragon Ball fans. And I get it, you just played Xenoverse or rewatched season 3 of Dragon Ball Z Abridge. And now you want to mock and call Sapo on Owlbear. But there's other ways to go with this. Radiant damage is often holy, so praise the sun and use it to blast your enemies. Maybe it's even part of your heritage. You have enough angel blood to release divine power. Or replace that angel blood with solar or crystal dragon. Breathing beams of light. Or maybe you're solar powered, spending your morning soaking in sunlight to release it later. You could even say you're part Darkling Bay and have to release absorbed light or you'll burn up from the inside. And there's plenty of constructs with radiant energy in their weapons. Maybe you're like an artificer grafting ray guns into their body. But it's useless, useless trying to put this off any longer. No matter what you think about the way of the astral self, good luck being heard over the people arguing if this is a Naruto or a JoJo's reference. Buckle in, this is a big one. The way of the astral self fights by creating a spectral reflection of your soul, then using it to beat the crap out of people. Level 3, for one key you summon your astral arms, attacking everyone you want within 10 feet for twice your martial arts die. They stick around for 10 minutes, letting you attack with an extra 5 feet of range and dealing force damage. They can use wisdom for strength checks and saves, as well as dex or strength based attacks. And since they're making unarmed strikes, you can flurry with them. And apparently this is controversial, but grappling is a strength check. You can use these arms to grapple. That does not leave them unable to attack either. There's no limit on the number of arms, and having your hands full doesn't stop you from unarmed attacking anyway. Anyway, at level 6 you can spend a point to summon the head. You can use the same bonus action as the arms if you like. It lets you see in darkness and magical darkness. You get advantage on insight and intimidation, and can either speak into someone's mind or blast your voice out 600 feet. That's twice as loud as most thunder spells. At 11, the body shows up for free whenever the arms and head are there. This lets you deal an extra die of unarmed damage once per turn, like a weaker but more consistent extra attack. Also, do you remember that thing where monks can deflect ranged attacks like arrows? Well, now you get that for any form of acid, cold, fire, lightning, thunder, or force damage. And if you get to level 17, the entire spirit comes out to play. 5 key nets you everything from before, but with plus 2 AC and an extra attack per round if you're only using your fist. So 3 attacks per round, 5 including flurry, extra damage on one of them, and who knows how many double dice hits on round 1. And yeah, it's 5 key, but at that point you have 17 per short rest. I know I'm spending a lot of time on this one, but 1, it's probably my favorite, 2, I keep hearing people say it's bad and I don't get why, because 3, unlike most people, I've actually played it. I just don't get why people keep looking at it saying it's bad and walking away. It's better than most monks. But before you go naming yourself after a cover band, I need to mention that there's no limit on what this can look like. Maybe you're a chef calling on things you've cooked in the past to serve you once more, or a long gone loved one protects you always. Perhaps in a past life you were the greatest of heroes, and in times of need that self comes back. If you worship a god or a demon or cosmic horror, they might start reaching through the void when you call. You're a vessel for sealed spirits, or a bay takes over, or even the soul of the planet manifesting in rage. Maybe a demon of desire lets your dream self manifest, but tightens her grip ever stronger as you grow. Maybe psionic experimentation lets a god start to form around you, manifesting from your fear before starving from lack of faith. You could change your form with every battle, mocking or scaring them with a fearsome avatar. You could even have a little marionette and control a big version you create. You have a second character design with no limitations. Go wild. By the way, longtime viewers, you want to hear a secret? Whenever I run Gruff the Buff, this is what he is. Astro Monk with a werebear ghost, training more of his kind. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, before I accidentally stuck myself into these class videos for some reason, I mainly did encounter in monster videos. I do want to get back into them after these next couple classes, but I'll probably do that even quicker through streaming, making little dungeons, or trying to make encounters out of monsters y'all feed me. We'll figure out something, so keep an eye on your sub feed for planned dates, and follow my Twitch if you want some casual gaming. At least, once I have the time and motivation again. You know how it goes, you stretch yourself thin because you want to improve and grow, then a little bit of bad luck puts you on the back foot eternally. I know, I should have given myself more room for life issues and failure, but instead I got burnt out before even starting. I'm reining myself in and should be back at it soon. Goblin guarantee. Honestly, I don't have a choice. The last few months about turned me into a drunken master. That's right, I've saved the best for last, and I'm doing this one authentic. Wait, what are you doing? I thought that was coffee. Sometimes. I use all the cups for a reason. Anyway, drunken master time. Because they don't know what you're gonna do if you don't. You're all nimble and stuff, so you stumble through enemy range without getting hit, and you move faster doing it. And at six, you can get up from prone for nearly free, and when people miss, you can spend a 
key to make him hit someone else. At 11, you get to spend two to get rid of disadvantage, and at 17, you just hit everyone. Like, you three more, you get three more blows in your flurry, just gotta be against different people, but you already move out of range and get extra speed, so you just hit everyone. Oh, and, and the best part is you get extra performance at the start, because it's all pretend. You still got your full wits about you. Oh, God. You really think I get drunk at work? I'm professional, and I'm not a lightweight. Come on. Anyway, that's also my takeaway for ideas. I know we all want to show our youthful spirit and go on a drunken rampage, and you do get the brewing kit to do that, but the core of this is just making sure your enemies can't predict your movement. You're going from Bruce Lee to Jackie Chan. You could be a jester, and the simple chaos of your footwork is just too fast and clever for pros to keep up with. Maybe you're an actor, or a stagehand, or even a cheerleader. Tumbling and fainting and fake balling. Boxers work great as well, bobbing and weaving through anything thrown at them. Maybe you're seeing a few seconds into the future and dodging their most likely attack. Or you're just really lucky or clumsy. Personally, I'd go for dancer. Actual dance fighting is thematic and great, but I'd opt for something like ballroom dancing, flowing to a rhythm that only you can hear, to a dance that only you know. Though I guess from that angle, you could also be Fortnite dancing through the battlefield, zipping around on a caffeine high knowing that anyone old enough to be a threat probably hasn't seen your TikTok feed. I sure haven't, and neither of the rest of the monks. Speaking of which, everyone likes to dunk on them, but I love them. They're great for new players, they train new DMs, they don't have the strength of the paladin or the power of the wizard, but I have never regretted playing a monk. And if I hear one more demand that our world's monks follow your world's rules, I'm gonna roll a d20 to see if your realistic knight actually died of cholera by age 14 and never disgraced my table. I love realism, but if we can accept literal magic and blatant violations of the square cube law, we can accept that someone stronger than a gorilla can hit as hard as your stick, okay? But if the monk just isn't quite what you're looking for, I would suggest rogue for similar skirmishing. And if you'd rather be a frontliner with more bulk, try barbarian or fighter. I'd also like to thank Barrel Goblin, Modern Masquerade, and Eldenier95 for support of my coffee. Link down below if you want to join them. And I'm sorry that content's been taking a little longer lately. I'm gonna go back to focusing on my videos and throw in streams whenever I got the time. I'm still gonna do them, but I'm not gonna make their prep my priority. Anyway, class dismissed. So that's not actually- Even without professionalism, I'm wearing a sweater dress in summer. You think I'm gonna drink? Fashion that important? It's for branding. Anyone seen in public has to follow campus dress code. Funny little wording that lets our boss stay in her office. But since I'm on camera, I have extra rules for consistency. So it's warm little sweater dress for me year round. I could have swore I heard her complain about it. Then you heard wrong. Or she just likes seeing me suffer more. Either one's plausible, but yeah, that's why I drink so much. Gotta stay hydrated. Speaking of which, I need to get a refill. Bye. Bye. <laughs>